Hello, and welcome to the East Africa Business Podcast. I'm Sam Ploy, and I'm here on the continent to learn about the emerging business scene. I'll be interviewing startups, investors, and organizations who are all playing their part in helping the region develop and grow. And in doing this podcast, I'll be sharing with you the things I learned along the way. Education is something which a lot of people are hungry for. Living Lab is a non-profit organisation in Tanzania that looks to empower people in low-income communities through giving training in entrepreneurship and leadership. In this interview, Victoria and I discuss the demographics of their participants, the logistics around organising rural education programmes, and why liquid soap production is a popular business idea. Without any further ado, here is Victoria. So I'm here with Victoria from Mbaya Living Lab. Victoria, welcome to the show. Thank you, Sam. So just to get us started, can you tell us a bit about you and a bit about your organisation? Okay, my name is Victoria John. I'm coming from Mbeya, it's the southern part of Tanzania, and I'm working with the non-profit organisation, but it's called um, Living Lab. Uh, in long term, it's called Mbeya Living Lab. Cool. So, so Mbeya is a region? Yes, it is a region. Okay. Is there... Are there other regions that have their own living lab? Or? Yes, we have about other four regions which have a living lab in Dar es Salaam, in Iringa, Sengerema, Arusha. Um, and what do all these living labs have in common? Uh, all these living labs are working with um, youth who are coming from a poor background and helping them to in entrepreneurship and leadership. And how do you do that? We train this um, youth. And there's certain programs. Uh, we have a unique program called um, Grow Next Level, which is being implemented in um, almost all the living labs. So, 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 what does that involve? Can you talk me through how the program works? Okay, so this program is um, it's a development program whereby the students have to go through a, a, a first program whereby they have to, it's more capacity building on entrepreneurship and leadership. And after they pass through that, they go on to the Grow Next Level where they have to come up with business projects or any idea that they want to implement in the community or in the business. And then we help them, we mentor, we coach. So Grow Next Level is all about coaching. There's um, students to be able to take their idea from idea stage to something that can be physically seen and done. So, so there are five living labs across Tanzania? Yes. And, and how many... Um, people are, are involved, how many, I don't want to call them end users, but the number of people who are going through the program? Uh, we, at a living lab, we have lots of programs going on. So to say in in each program, I can say in a total, you can maybe you can say that how many people do we have in this program. For our living lab, we've had about 60 participants who have passed through the program. We've started running this program since last year. But for other living labs, they've started running this program earlier than us. I see. And how long does the program last? It's a six-month program. Okay. And so is it a full-time thing or a part-time? Uh, this is a part-time thing. We all usually start with um, four strict, I mean, four weeks where they come every day. But then throughout the other months, they come twice a week. Okay. Yeah. So just talk about this, right? There are, there are people who are um, sort of living in, in rural areas. They do a four-week sort of introduction program, and then after that, they do a series of programs for the next six months, all about teaching them skills to do entrepreneurship. Yes, so exactly. What's the typical demographic of the, um, of the person? Are they uh, always the same age? What's what do they look like? Um, we are dealing with different people, and especially in the age groups, it's usually people from eighteen years old up to we've had people up to forty-three years old attending this program, but our maximum usually is from 18 to 29 years old. Yes. And are there any uh, similarities in the types of projects that they want to do? Mm, I may say yes. Yes, this is, um, there they is, because um, there is a lack of a bit of innovation, but we see that they do have, the, like, there is similarities in the projects. Okay. Uh, how so? Um, you might find that it's hard for someone to, if you, maybe we tell them, like, if you have any idea you want to implement, just put it out there. They're afraid to say, maybe, um, say that I want to do this project. Maybe it's crazy. People think of me, like, 
this can be done. But then they'll go with the usual thing that anyone else would do. So in the same thing, in the same line, you find that they're doing the similar. I mean, they're doing something similar to each other instead of going on with something that would be more innovative or creative. So, so, so what are some of the the more mainstream ones that lots of people do? Main ones, um, we have liquid soap production. We have um, even computer training. This is something that is done everywhere. And so you find that maybe someone's like, oh, I want to like engage myself in making a certain product which is already in the market. But then if you try to like tell them like, how can you make it more maybe innovative? That's when they get stuck. So they're doing something that is already there, but then they don't find a way to make it a bit more innovative. I see. Um, I might have misunderstood, but did you hint that there are some people who do think about innovative ideas, mm -hmm. but then don't follow through? Yes. Do you have an example of some of those innovations that people have thought of, but don't, but don't go through with? Yeah. So uh, we've had um, a gentleman, he, he came up with an idea of, um, to use, um, is it, I think, solar energy to be able to, he has actually uh, implemented this um, project in a village where he said he used just normal batteries and, um, and some bulbs to light up electricity. It's kind of like a complicated thing when you hear it, but then he said this is a, something that works and he would like to do it, but then when we told him that we can support you with the coaching on how to do it, he was afraid to go out there and say, um, maybe my idea will be stolen, so I can't like take this idea out. Maybe I'll do the same thing. So he started engaging himself in filmmaking and then I left that idea. So it was huh. So it, it was it was less risky for him to do filmmaking than yes. it was to do solar panel. Yes. Interesting. Um when it comes to um, the actual material that you're yeah. giving people, mm -hmm. are there some things which people are like, yep, got it, understood, move on. Mm -hmm. And there's some things that you need to you need to sort of go over lots of times because people do not understand. Um, there are a couple of things that um, we need to really like go over it, um, especially when starting up a business or maybe starting up a project. This is some of the things that we have to go through um, because most of our problems, we don't think we, we like financially support them, but we support their ideas or maybe mentoring and coaching them. So we have this thing that they have to start from zero. Like there's no source of any like funds or anything. So they have to come with something that um, which doesn't have a financial support. So sometimes we have to go through and through all over again because no one can really understand you and say, um, come up with an idea when you don't have to use any. We don't we're not giving you money, but come up with something that you can generate and then in the end you see something out of it. So this is something that we are struggling to keep on now. Yeah. yeah. So just so I've got some the, the the program involves creating a business with no financing. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do you do that? Well, we are looking at um, we're saying that when someone is an entrepreneur, you have to have a little bit of creativity in yourself. And when you're looking at creativity, you can start with something as small as maybe a water bottle. We have had um, different cases or in other living labs and even in our living lab as well that people are starting with um, um, an environmental project uh, making dustbins out of water bottles and they're selling this and people are like wow like wow we didn't know that um, these water bottles can be turned into a trash can and we can actually use them so they're starting off with trash cans and um, they're selling this and then they're getting the money so our natural or maybe the same our resources just surrounding us sometimes can provide us the money that we need, but that's what we want them to think for us. Like what we have, we can use that instead of we give you money, like go and do this and go and do that. So that's how we unleash that creativity in them. So, yeah. Right. And why is it called Living Lab? A Living Lab. Well, this is a it's not, it's not like a laboratory where we're dealing with chemicals, we're dealing with people and um, we're dealing with people who are coming from low backgrounds and poor backgrounds, um, people who have given up on their lives mostly and are looking for a new path in their lives. So we're kind of like bringing them into this 
living life where they are people who need to be changed and they need to be transformed and have a new mindset. So this is how we came up with this living lab tool. And so how long has the living lab sort of organization been going for? Um, for now, we are running for four years. We have started since 2012 to now. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. and, and who was it that started it? Um, the person who started this uh, is uh, my other colleague. His name is Wolo Stano. There. Yes, he's the one who started this. And with the support of a Tanz ICT project, which has been running here in Tanzania, we've been able to run our project, I mean, our living lab team now. I see. Um, can you explain what is Tanz tan ICT? Oh, Tanz ICT is a bilateral program which um, was brought by the Finnish government and the Tanzanian government in order to bridge the gap of ICT knowledge in Tanzania. I see. Um, and are there sort of similar type programs with other governments or is it just mainly Finland that are doing this? Um, it's mainly Finland. Okay. Yes. Um, do, do Finland and Tanzania have a particular friendly past? Like, uh, those are two countries that I would have, I would have naturally paired together. Mm -hmm. um, I may say yes, because I, I can see a lot of... Um, most of like non-governmental organizations are dealing, uh, I see most of like Finnish people coming here and even there's, there are, there's a good ground between the Finnish and the Tanzanian government. And I've seen that there's no like any kind of, so I think we're good, we're good. <laughs> Never met, no beef. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Okay. Um, and when you sort of look at the next uh, sort of, Few years. What do you think? Uh, what do you think Living Lab will look like? How will it? How will it evolve? Wow. Okay. So in the next coming years, I think Living Lab will be another thing, especially because um, in our region this is something totally new, and people are slowly like accepting it and knowing all, all about it and how it functions. Because when you tell someone what a Living Lab is, it's kind of like, what is this? But now people are more aware, are getting aware of it. And I think for the next few years to come, it will be a, a, a big change maker, like an um, organization in my region, or even in Tanzania at large. How do, you, how do you measure success in your business, in your organization? We measure success by the number of people who are, are coming out of the organization, going to implement or doing something. I mean, when you say implement something, what, what are they? Uh, it, it, either it's a project. So we're looking at the people who are coming out. So if the people that we're training or if the people we're giving the coaching to, at the end of the day, they're not, they're going back to the same place they were, then to us it's a failure. But I'll say that we measure success by the number of people who are coming out with going to do, even going to implement a certain something even small, even something that can or feel that their life has, has been changed at a certain level. That's how we see it as success. And uh, and so you say that with um, with your region there are sixty people who have been through. Mm -hmm. So those are sixty people who have completed the six month course. Yeah. And and how many of those are doing the project? How many of those have been successful? Oh okay. yeah. From there we have about ten. From the 60, we have about 10 who have been able to. Some of them have um, gone and uh, with employment, they've gotten themselves employed. Some of them have um, are running their own businesses, and some of them decided to go back to school. So, the, yeah. when you say the people who have gone into employment and started mm -hmm. their project, mm -hmm. those are the 10. Yes. I see, and then the other 50 have gone back to what they're doing. Yeah, the other 50 have gone back to what they're doing, and some of them have, some did leave before the program ended because of some other personal issues of their own. So these are two cycles different. One was um, which was done last year where we had 30 people and the other one was this year where we had 30 people. I see. Yes. Okay. What have been the main lessons that you've learned from doing your first two cycles? Wow. Um, <laughs> the people, of course, and also um, participation and just commitment, being committed to what we're doing 
that's one that's the biggest lesson I've learned that you have to be really committed to really um, change someone. <laughs> like if you don't put your heart into it, then failure is at your doorstep. Like, but you have to really commit yourself. That's the biggest lesson. Okay, and how does the how will the third cycle how will that differ to the first two? Yeah. So for the third cycle, with we're looking at um, at other people who are going to be like assisting us. So we looked at um, university students who currently are looking for maybe a part time or a, a place where they can like use their talents. So we have had a couple of um, university students coming to wanting to volunteer and looking like, okay, where can they volunteer? So we said that, how about we use this university students to be part of the program? And also as a way, another way we decided to um, try to get like uh, at the end of the program to have a competition of maybe a pitch competition for these students to be able to um, maybe get financed, finance at the end or um, just get the idea out there for someone to see that they have also potential. Because when we just do it alone, they'll see that maybe, oh, we might not go far, but maybe if they see someone who's um, who can support them, they'll be really like ready to do it. Um, is it difficult to convince people to come on the program? Um, not really. It's so not, not really. Why, why is that? Uh, because it's a demand. People want to get out of the streets. People are tired of doing the same thing every day. So when we advertise or when we give out opportunity like that, they always get phone calls and people are like, when is it starting? When uh, when it weighs this program? What are you guys doing? When do we start? So it's a demand out there. So it's not, even if we think quiet, people won't come. But when we talk, they do come because they are, there is a demand for this in our community. See, and um, so how many applications are there for the 30 places? Um, it's what application? Uh, roughly how many applicants are there for each position? Uh, for the students or the, the volunteers? For the students. For the students, we have 30. 30. And how yeah. many people apply for those 30? As in for this cycle? Yes. Uh, no, not yet. We haven't yet um, opened up okay. the in, next cycle. In the last cycle? How many applications did you receive for the 30 people? Oh, we received about, uh, it was 35, but we took 30. So, yes. cool. And what is the selection criteria? What, what, what are you thinking when you when you say, we do want to have this person on the program, or we do not want to have this person? Okay, so one thing we look at, especially now, is we're looking at the age criteria, and also we're looking at people who, are really like ready to commit um, their whole being or their not <laughs> the whole life, uh, but the whole being in in the program because we want to avoid that people not finishing the program, like someone starts and then they give up along the way. So we we're looking at someone who has um, great commitment, uh, but also an age criteria with, from 18 years old to 29, and um, also someone who can read and write. Although it can be, <laughs> that is not like our biggest criteria, but someone who can read and write, who sometimes want to present and do other things. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, how do you test for commitments? <laughs> how do you test for commitments? Yeah. So, yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's quite challenging to see at first, like, oh, this person is really committed. But we do ask. <laughs> of course, someone can lie. <laughs> But we do ask, like, are you really 100%? We do ask a uh, certain interview, we go through with the person and we see if this person is right to go with the program. So we interview them. I see, I see. And when it comes to the, the sort of the actual delivery of the training, mm -hmm. is it done in person or is it done electronically? Uh, it's done in person. And yes. where is it held? Uh, we have a physical space um, at our region. When we are running this activity. See, and, and how easy is it for people, easy or difficult is it for people to get there? Uh, it's quite easy. It's, it's in the center of the uh, of the town, so it's we're actually near the the center, the like what, the bus stand. Yeah, 
So where all the buses from all different areas, where they, that's where our center is located. So anyone can reach to our space. Great. Yeah. Great. And do you find that um, when people are working, do they do they ever sort of like form partnerships or, or form groups, or is it everybody thirty people working on thirty separate ideas? Um, no, they work as groups. That's one thing we like we emphasize for people to work as a team and if it's there, there hasn't been someone who has come up with a oh I have a single idea but we have people um, working in groups uh, as a team so that's what we really emphasize on see mm -hmm. and who are the people who are who are delivering the training um, I'm one of the people okay. I'm one of the people uh, who delivers the trainings and we have other people as well from the living lab, so we're about uh, four of us. Yeah. So, and and how do you how do you as the trainers know what to say? Like who trains you? Uh, we have ourselves before because before this program we went we undertook um, a TOT training of trainers, and um, throughout this whole course, what we're going to teach. So everyone felt comfortable in their in the areas to teach. Just like myself, I felt comfortable teaching on leadership and entrepreneurship. And my other partners also chose their comfortable place where they could be comfortably teaching. And it's going great. And everyone now feels very much confident and comfortable. Okay. Yeah. And so for you, what is the, the most important thing that you like that you would need to make sure that your students know? Wow. How to <laughs> come up with an idea. That's Okay. Yeah. So for you, the, the most important thing yeah. that you want to teach is how to come up with an idea. Yeah. And how do you do that? Well, we have different tools that we have, um, I think, different tools that we have that uh, from, um, like, we have different, I, um, I, can just, I can't draw right now because I can't, uh, but we have different tools that we use. If you're maybe familiar with um, Lotus Flower, it's a tool to generate an idea or problem solving. We have um, a first generator idea thing, which um, you can just use to um, come up with an idea. So these are um, kind of like different tools that you use. This I find this most fascinating because this is where you can get a creative idea or not come up with the same thing. So this is actually something that I'm going to, these are some of the tools which I'll be using this the next coming cycle. So, yeah. So, um, so what sort of uh, what sort of ideas have, come, have any sort of ideas come up where you've been like, gosh, I never would have thought of that? Have you have you been surprised by the creativity of the students, or in all of them have you sort of seen, okay, I can kind of if I give you a lotus of flower, mm -hmm. you know, I can kind of predict what ideas you're going to come up with, or anyone mm -hmm. done ideas and you can like, wow, not expecting that. Um, well, I think the students have not yet used these tools. Um, but from according to what, like, it has been hard for them to really think out the box, that's for sure. But I can say maybe one or two have, like, surprised me on um, some of the ideas that they came up with. So it's just a mix-up of, um, of stuff. And um, one idea that came up is um, how can I, like, can I make, um, like, uh, one of the students made a dress out of paper, and the dress really looked good. So it was one of the, <laughs> um, and I, something that I found like, wow, okay. And it was just someone who was very quiet in the in the one of the class of students. And then when we said, okay, there's a paper, come up with something, and the student made a dress. Oh, you were expecting she was going to write down her idea. <laughs> Um, how does how does Living Lab sustain itself in terms of the, the mm -hmm. cover its costs and, and things? Okay, so the Living Lab, um, as a, as we just finished um, up the Transit City program, which was financially supporting us, and um, but currently we do have our own um, businesses which we run to cover some of the costs, like maybe electricity bills, water bills, and other running costs. So we run a dry cleaning business and also we do, we run other events 
um, for other people. So that's how we can like generate our income to sustain some of the costs. I see. So is yeah. this the um, this is the trainers who are running these businesses, or who are the people sort of operating the businesses? Yeah, the trainers. So, so yeah. you so, so you run one of the businesses. Yeah. In part of your job, and then the other part is to train people. Mm-hmm. Which bit, which business do you do? I do the dry cleaning. All right. yeah. what, what is there to know about dry cleaning? Hmm? What, what are the main things to know about dry cleaning? <laughs> Just make it clean. <laughs> Just make it clean. That's pretty solid advice. Right? Yeah. Cool. Okay. Um, and do you, what, what's your sort of split at the time? Is it 50 50? Mm-hmm. What's the. Um, I'm full time. That's like my full time job. Oh, sorry. And then yeah. the split between doing the dry cleaning and the training. Oh, okay. So. It's yeah, it's fifty fifty, but most of my time I'm usually doing um, the training part because the training doesn't really take like um, the whole day. It's usually two hours per day. So after I do two hours, maybe I may do some other administrative work, and then right after it, I can go to the dry cleaning. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So we'll just do a few more questions. Yeah. It's okay. Um, so do you, do you see yourself um, sort of continuing at Living Lab for the foreseeable future? Or is it sort of, is it like, is it a project that has a finite end point? Um, this is a never ending project I see myself because a Living Lab will always be a Living Lab even without a beauty. Because we started this without a physical space. So that's how a Living Lab started. So even when we, even we tell ourselves that even if we don't have a space, a Living Lab will continue going on because we're touching each and everyone. So it's not about the space, but it's about reaching out to the people and giving others training. So maybe if they try to maybe kill me if I die, that's when the living up dies. <laughs> so um, that's what I see. For, for the next years, I see the living up being there, even if it's not financial, but the people are there to work. I see. But, yeah. And is, will living up just remain in Tanzania or will it be going to other places? Um... Living Lab um, originated from South Africa. I forgot to say that at first. Yeah, it originated from, from South Africa. There's Ara Labs. Um, it's called Re- Re- Reconstructing um, Labs. Yeah. So this is where it originally started. But then we have, um, we, it came to Tanzania and is spreading all over Africa. So I think next will be Kenya, or Uganda, even Southern African parts. Yeah. Okay. And and how can people listening at home sort of follow the journey of of of, uh, of living lab? Is that you have a, a social media presence or a website? Oh yes, uh, we do have a Facebook page, uh, Bear Living Lab. You just type Bear Living Lab, you find it. Um, we also have a WordPress. Um, it's also called Bear Living Lab with the double B. Um, dot WordPress dot com. We have a Twitter at Bear Lab. Yeah. Awesome. And I'll, okay, I'll, I'll link to those in the show notes as well so people can find them. Yeah, okay. Cool. So, Victoria, thanks so much. Thank you so much, Sam, for having me. Before we head, just a quick moment to say thank you for listening. You can see the show notes of this episode by heading to samfloy.com forward slash podcast and then searching for the episode title. That's S A M F L O Y dot com forward slash podcast. Now, a few people have got in touch and have been asking about how this podcast came about. And well, it all started when I took a one-way flight to Rwanda to seek out business opportunities across the region. I'm now at the stage of formulating a bit of a plan of the business I want to go into, based on all of these podcast interviews, and we'll be keeping a record of what I get up to on my blog. And so if you're interested in being kept in the loop, you can sign up to the newsletter there. Again, it's samfloy.com. Also, if you have any questions, comments, or feedback about the podcast, or indeed anything, please feel free to email me, podcast at samfloy.com, and I'd be very happy to chat. In any case, have a great week and speak to you soon.